I didn't know how to get used to being a 30-year-old man when I'd never lived as a boy or male youth at all. There is undeniably a stereotypical assumption of a good NB. And the really sick thing about this NB stereotype is that it is rife with fat phobia and pretty privilege. Your androgyny must be pretty faced thin, no room for compromise or self-expression, aging or weight gain or balding or you know, reality. People load you with assumptions, whatever you are, and the shoe doesn't fit. I don't want to make every conversation I have about gender, it's, it's weird and boring to do that, I feel like. So hello YouTube, and welcome to a rare positive moment amidst the seriously dysfunctional tales of my messy life. We're going to be talking about gender identity today and how I discovered mine, then all the various stages of grief, dysphoria, euphoria and confusion in the heavy decisions that followed. I still get a lot of questions, so here comes all of it, the full story. But before all that, I need to tell you about how, after wandering this odd little earth for the better part of three decades, with no clue at all what I wanted to do with myself, what my fucking purpose was here, writing found me, and it unleashed more magic and some really weird shit than I could ever imagine. Writing was the key to literally everything, including gender, for me. I was in my first year of university, but I was also 26 years old. My eating disorder had, with no pun intended, devoured the majority of my youth, depriving me of so many essential teenage experiences. Going to uni at 26 or older is still fun, and you are as young as you're ever going to be, seriously. If you're sitting on the fence and going, should I go to uni, should I not? Like, am I too old? Because that's how I always felt, was that, oh, I'm too old, I've missed the bus. It's like, you're, you're only getting older, and 26 is still really young, and I'm glad I went overall, apart from the debt element. Um... <laughs> Going to uni at 26 or older is still fun, certainly a welcome break from the hellish office jobs that preluded it, but when you've already been drinking, drugging, clubbing and fucking for years on end, you can't really relate to the herds of drunken, singing, spewing 18 year olds, all revelling in their very first taste of free adult life. But more than any of that, I didn't go there for the social element. I'd finally relented and gone to uni because I was on a singular mission. I wanted to become a writer. I'd probably wanted it all of my life if I'd been more self-aware, buried somewhere beneath all the apathy about growing up at all. But since my nervous breakdown in 2009... And that oddly intense moment with a paramedic when my body was busy dying of an overdose and he asked me what I wanted to be doing. <laughs> like, really doing with my life instead of all this miserable shit. And I'd said, I want to be a writer. The words flying free of my shuddering carcass when I hadn't even realised that I did want that. After that, like I said, I was on a mission. <laughs> I'd had this story stuck in my head for years, but I could never get out more than a chapter, at which point I'd realised the writing was so ugly and clunking. Every damn time I had to delete the lot in burning frustration, then hate myself even harder. I tried a creative writing course, but to no avail. And I just figured maybe I had to do the whole thing properly. Maybe there was magic in university. And there fucking ought to be the amount of debt I was putting myself in. The amazing thing was, as small and shitty as that university was, that uni actually did hold magic. I had a wonderful creative writing teacher, Denise, who would be supportive of everything I later wrote, no matter how gruesome, drug-spangled or bizarre it was. And I still remember the exact moment the egg just cracked inside her classroom, and suddenly all the words that were locked up inside, keeping the story stale and stilted and impossible, came flooding out in a slippery embryonic slick and the thing was born. Denise had pinned a selection of images on the board. I looked up at that board and saw a picture of the Birmingham Bullring, all lit up neon in the dark. 
That place had always reminded me of some giant dollop of alien gunge that had fallen from outer space and landed on Brum, draping itself gooily over the biggest mall in the city. A rather ruder opinion is that it looks like some asshole stole the hubcaps off every car from Sutton to Selly and then blue tacked them all over a madly shaped blue tarpaulin. Honestly, the bullring is weird and came ahead of its time. It was not a popular part of the changed landscape back then, but now, now I love it. It's lit up silver blue nocturnal eeriness and it's memories, mostly. Memories of everything that's happened up there. On top of it, beneath endless moons smudged with blood and drugs and bourbon, the bull ring belongs to me. <laughs> to us, has become our place since 2011. I mean, not in this reality. Never have I ever, in the flesh, scaled that mad monolith and had a 3am rave up there, but by God, my characters have. And writing to me, particularly about them, the ones who got me started and gave me so much, the ones forged to my soul forevermore, my vampire characters, it feels so real that they might as well be true memories. How could they not be when they changed my life forever? Of course it happened somewhere out there. So that was the very first scene I ever truly wrote. My four vampires sprawled out on the edge of that mad silver blue hubcappy bullring, watching the neon spin by as they drank blood and whiskey and mourned the death of the oldest friend any of them had ever truly known. And the minute, the second those words were on the page, I couldn't stop. I was still writing garbage, of course, stylistically. It was genuinely embarrassing garbage. But somehow, despite that, it had come alive for me. It had gained a beating heart and all of the electrical, magical impulses that come with that visceral, wetly pumping organ. So I went home and wrote up a list of every scene in the planned book. Then every day I'd wake up early, choose any scene that appealed in any order and write and write all day long. It was total hyperfixation heaven. <laughs> I was in love with it, spinning magic from the ether, letting conversations spill onto the page when even I hadn't known what those characters would say or do. They were as real to me as any human anywhere because they were as unpredictable as living people. I learned something new about them every day from their own mouths. I finished the first book in a heartbeat and immediately flowed onto a second volume because I would die, just shrivel up and die if I ever stopped writing about, thinking about and loving those characters. And then magic begot magic. The vampires were in a band. And despite the fact I'd never written a song or a poem and couldn't play or sing, Pretty soon, through me, they'd written and released an album, 4AM Vampire Blues, which is no longer live, but maybe, just maybe, someday might return to the world. But I never claimed the rights to those songs, by the way. If anyone told me they were great songs or nice lyrics or terrible ones, I couldn't exactly say thank you or sorry. <laughs> because they weren't even my songs. I hadn't written them. The vampires did. And I know that sounds mad, but until you've experienced the magic of being incapable of doing something like writing or poetry or music or all of the above, and then suddenly you've allowed a fictional entity to work through you and they've spun magic through your hands, your voice, how can you not, to some degree, believe in them? And crazy things did happen. <laughs> I wrote a female character whose singing voice changed when she became immortal, getting raspier and more powerful, and then she joined the band, and I lived vicariously through that character, because my own singing voice was a wimp of a thing. I wanted to sound like Brody Dahl, Courtney Love would have killed for that. And you know what happened? Precisely three months after I created that character and her voice... My own fucking voice began changing. It wasn't technique. I wasn't learning fry or false chord screams. And believe me, I had tried every method under the sun of gaining a rasp all in vain. But now suddenly I was developing an incredibly pronounced natural rasp in my singing voice. My speaking voice has always sounded exactly like this, but my singing voice was 
totally different. And to this day, it makes up the majority of my singing voice, which some people think sounds god awful, like an ugly, great talking chainsaw. And I don't give a shit. I love it. By now, life purposes were stacking up. Writing, which would always come first and foremost. But now I toyed with the idea of joining a band too. Something that nearly happened until a gigantic juggernaut of a clusterfuck splattered right over my life and tossed every single plan I had off track. We'll get to that bit soon. To be fair, it's kind of the reason I started doing YouTube at all. So if my life hadn't got fucked sideways, we wouldn't be here talking to each other at all. So all that matters for now is that the one thing this fucking thing couldn't derail was my writing my connection to my characters. They still weren't done giving me surprising gifts, like, to finally get to the point, my gender identity. I'd always had a thing for writing these ridiculously over-the-top comedy complaints letters, so I bestowed that tendency on one of my vampires, specifically a guy named Eden. I let him rant and rave and grow fumingly aristocratically indignant over the many sins of the mortal world, vitamin adverts that appeared to be attempting to flog him a glass of piss, lemon mousse that looked like the jism of Beelzebub, bath bombs that dissolved to release seaweed strands that resembled herds upon herds of slippery black hell leeches and... As Eden repeatedly tore customer service departments the most ridiculous of new assholes. I realised just how much easier and more comfortable I found it speaking through the voice of a guy, not a girl. Pretty quickly, I realised that I always found it easier writing male characters than female. And this was almost certainly the reason I'd struggled so hard to start writing at all. I'd always tried to write as a woman because apparently that's what I was, right? Before about 2012, a boy without a winky is a girl, to quote Blackadder. Only writing as a man was fluid, effortless. And as I began realising this, my physical style started to change. Or maybe that was just an accident. I'd stumbled across a YouTube tutorial for huge punk hairdos. And as soon as I tried it out, giving myself nearly two foot long liberty spikes all over my head, I loved it. Because if I paired it with the right outfit, playing up my flat chest, I looked genderless, almost male. And I still remember the first night I went out like that to a club night called Machine. Towards the end, this random dickhead got all pushy with a female friend trying to make her drink this drink he'd bought. It was all a bit fishy. And she clearly didn't know what to do with herself. So I just stepped between the two of them and told him to get the fuck out of her face. My hair made me taller, the gender fuck made me feel stronger somehow, and the fact he immediately turned around and sodded off without saying a single word was deeply satisfying. I'd even found interacting with girls at the club so much easier somehow now that I was talking to them from the place I rapidly began to realise should have been my place all along. Not as a fellow girl, but as something else. Something far closer to a boy. And obviously, this sort of thing makes you think. If I wasn't born the right way, I wondered. If I'm not who I was always told I am, then who the hell am I? Who should I be? More to the point, what can I do about it now? Once I realised that the answer to this first question was undoubtedly, I'm a boy. <laughs> I should have been born a mostly gay boy. I realised another stupidly obvious thing. The reason that Poppy Zebright's literature had always been my favourite was that, just like the author himself, I wanted to be in it instead of biologically landing on the other side of the pitch. The book that hurt the most as I reread it through these new eyes was The Value of X, about a gay teenage couple. Their young bodies fitting perfectly together, their nervous first fumbles, youthful souls clicking into place as they struggle to work out the truth of themselves and the world outside. That fucking hurt. Because it was something I could never, ever have, wasn't it? Even if I went for all the gender reassignment surgery on the planet, and even if it worked like a dream and there were zero complications, I would never, 
ever have the youth experiences that I ought to have had. It's kind of similar being diagnosed with autism, realising how many experiences ought to have gone so differently, so naturally, if you and the people around you had only fucking known the truth about who you were. And every time I went to Tesco and saw some lithe young gay couple walking tentatively hand in hand, it stung a little more. So I researched a lot about reassignment stuff and it was pretty fucking disappointing back in the early 2010s. These days they've at least realised they can give you low-dose testosterone so that you remain in a sort of androgynous boyish state rather than going naught to hairy ape man in the space of a handful of months. Which can happen to some people, not everyone, but some people, whoo, the hair, you know, you go bald, hair sprouts everywhere else. It's like an intense change so very fast, you know, because back in early 2010s, they didn't seem to realise maybe titration with this stuff is kind of the way to go. Um, so the low dose thing sounded so much easier to handle and more in my ballpark. And if I'd known about it back then, probably I would have gone for it. But at this point, 12 years later... I feel like the decision's made, and I'm more or less at peace with that. Back then, though, I questioned all of it, the full-on transition, all the way up to major surgery to get a whacking great cock. <laughs> I wrote a story as I researched a facetious little piece called Pete's New Dick about a guy who does go all the way, then is so proud of his brand new dick, he... Well, it gets a bit silly, but he's dizzy with joy, overwhelmed with phallic pride. For me, it was all or nothing, which isn't actually the way many trans guys do it. Plenty skip bottom surgery or stick with a far more simple metoidoplasty, which is a smaller, safer surgery, but only leaves you with a micro penis. However, the sensation in that penis is going to be if I was going to transition, though, being an Aries with all of that big dick energy we, we tend to want to exude when actually we're incredibly insecure and generally complete fuck-ups inside, but I wanted all of it full-on phalloplasty for a full-size erectable cock. And sadly, the science wasn't and still isn't up to the standard I personally want. I don't even think you can get a phalloplasty done in the UK right now. I think we don't have any doctors who do it in the UK. I might be wrong about that, but certainly a year or so ago, this was the case. Like, it's, it's hardcore surgery. If I was going male to female, I'd have gone for it. But female to male, they're not just turning a mountain into a valley. They've got to create something out of nothing for us. And that means it's a lot more brutal, a lot more hit and miss, and there's a lot more room for complications. One of my biggest doubts, honestly, related to sexual sensation. Given that most of your dick is formed from the skin of your thigh or forearm, and while those areas are sensitive, does it really feel like sex? Would it? Did I want to risk it all on a maybe? Because it varies for everyone and there's really no way to find out until you get it done because you don't know how successful the surgery is going to be for you personally. It's kind of like getting your clip pierced. There's a good chance you're going to lose all sexual sensation there, but it can also heighten it and make it amazing. It's like, do you want to gamble it? Um... So you keep your clitoris tucked away in your ball sack, but your vaginal passage is stripped right out. And for me... TMI, but sexual sensation is largely internal, which is fantastic when it comes to sex, but pretty shit if you want a gender reassignment. Crazy thing about all that research, though, all that thinking about having a dick, you start having wildly vivid sex dreams where you actually do. My brain was obsessed with the subject. It was, in fact, the first time in my whole life that I'd ever had sex dreams and a raging sex drive, which I guess makes sense. If you've never had the right tackle to shag with, is it any wonder you've got little to no interest in shagging at all? Suddenly, I realised that sex wasn't sexy to me because I was viewing it from completely the opposite angle of my correct gender and sexual preference. Um, yeah, if you've read any of my writing, I, I think it's pretty obvious that I, I find vagina it's quite scary and quite like what is this unknown territory it's like I don't like it um because 
because I was meant to be a gay boy. This is, you know, even like you've lived, you've lived with, you lived with a pussy for like however many years, but it was never, it was never meant to be what you were dealing with in bed. Therefore, I think it explains that weird revulsion I have about vaginas generally. Um, so in my dreams, admittedly, sometimes it was with a woman. Mostly it was with a man. But I was 95% of the time the top in the situation, Aries. <laughs> and the sensation of, well, let's just say all of it before this gets so pornily graphic, YouTube blacklists me. The sensation in these dreams was so real. I would reliably wake up in absolute agony as my body attempted to climax through an organ that wasn't physically there. Like, it genuinely hurts. You're having a great time in this dream and then you wake up and it's like, oh, ow, 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 because your body's trying to do something it physically can't. It's weird, man. Has anyone else had that experience? I put it down to past life memories, maybe? The accuracy, the detail, but maybe there is something inside trans brains that just knows on some lizardy brainstem level how our organs are meant to work, even the ones biology left out. I don't know, it's kind of a soul versus brain versus body thing. What do you believe in? I don't know. So that was another thing. Compared to the vivid, hyper-real sensations that came in my dreams and my imagination, could a chunk of thigh skin and, you know, all that healing time, all the trauma of that hospital stay, all of that, could it compare ever? And what about all the complications? What about my hatred of hospitals, my fear of multiple major surgeries? What about the fact I was leaning in on 30 back then and might immediately go bald on tea? I would not handle that well. There was way, way too much uncertainty about the whole damn process. And what about my newly morphed singing voice, huh? What about the fact I'd wanted that my entire life and it gave me so much pleasure and it had come about through vampiric literary magic and now I was about to just toss the whole thing in the air like a gambler's dice? Maybe I'd end up sounding like Johnny Cash and it'd be the best thing ever, but maybe I'd fuck it all to shit and lose music as a hobby forever. And what about pretty privilege as it's termed these days? I'd spent my entire life a relatively tolerable looking female and I didn't know how to make a single friend, my autistic ass didn't at all, still doesn't, without going out looking slutty and waiting till people came to me. As I was rapidly learning, whenever I went out as a boy, I became invisible to people. Either that or intimidating, I couldn't tell. But either way, it didn't make me any friends. No one talks to you. It was like a social experiment I would do. I would go out in like in girl mode some weeks and looking like a boy in other weeks. Girl mode, people come up, people talk to you, people chat to you. You go out looking like a boy. No fucker talks to you. Even the girls giving you weird looks because they're like, you're in the wrong bathroom, dude. They don't come up and say anything to you. I mean, I guess you kind of look like you're an asshole in there. Being, so maybe that, maybe that one's my bad. I don't know. But... Even like out in the club, no one talks to you. It's so weird. Um, and then there was the great, big, ugly, brutal what about. That for the rest of my life, if I transitioned, I would have to have the exact same horrible, stressful, intense conversation with sexual partners about what I was, what I used to be and how they felt about it. And when precisely was it even the time to tell them you're trans? How do you do it? And how do you feel if they immediately turn away? It was a lot. It is a lot for anyone. I thought through every tiny little thing it would mean. And those things added up to a lot. All in all, in the end, it just wasn't who I was in my head. All that, the guy with all those difficulties, all those extra difficulties perpetual urinary tract infections, potential lack of sexual sensation, likely balding eventually, possibly hairy all over, nervously wondering who's a transphobe and who isn't. When you're about to choose such a huge part of how you're perceived when it comes to transitioning physically and how you live, deciding to live with all these pains and problems is 
I think you just have to be 110% bothered about male versus female, about being seen as a man above all other things, or that's how it seemed to me at the time. And I just didn't fit that description because my identity was more flexible. It always has been. You know, you've seen how much my style jiggles about all over the place. I've got like a disgusting amount of clothes because I, I can't pick a style and settle on it, even, you know, in male or female or in between. I, you know, in terms of who I feel like being that day, it, it wobbles all over the place. Um and my brain was far too immature, even at nearly 30, than it needed to be to cope with all this intensely heavy shit. If I'd been 18 when I'd worked it out, with a healthy young body that would heal from surgery, that wouldn't bald or grow much hair for years to come, and I'd still have my whole youth ahead of me to live out honestly as the mostly gay boy I always should have been, then fuck, I'd have probably done it. But to my mind, it was just too damn late. I didn't know how to get used to being a 30-year-old man when I'd never lived as a boy or male youth at all. Too much change, too much stress for my autistic ass, totally impossible. And then over the course of the next few years, and maybe this is connected, I became a raging alcoholic and got too fat to even pass for male in clubs, at which point I really had to accept this increasingly flawed body as all I'm ever fucking getting. And really... After a long period of searing self-hatred, suicidal ideation, trashing my room, writing insults all over the walls about how fat and female I was, everything became astoundingly tolerable. <laughs> I don't like it, but I guess things happen that way, as Johnny Cash would put it. I haven't even thought about surgery or testosterone or any of it in years at this point, not seriously at least. The low-dose tea thing intrigues me, I'll admit, but I just don't want any more change at this point in my life and I have fucking huge problems in my life that I just... I, it's really... It's so far down my fucking list right now. It really is. But I did have to change one thing, and a pretty big thing. My name was something I had always, always vehemently despised... And now, I guessed, I'd figured out one of the reasons why I hated my name so much. It wasn't just that school bullying and the weight of failed parental expectations had dumped so much filth all over my old name. It was that the name was completely the wrong gender and therefore it had to go. I made lists of new names like we all do, mashing together combinations of first and second and even surname until I conceded that my dad would erupt if I got rid of that too. So reluctantly, I left my surname alone and became a hybrid of Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray and the Poppy Z Bright character I'd based all my teenage usernames on. Even if the latter is so weird, it looks like a clerical error and my mother detests it. I do admittedly have some regrets about my name change. Not that I did it but that I went public with my name here on YouTube. I never expected nor even intended this channel to go anywhere. So thinking up some bizarre public persona never crossed my mind in the beginning, but I fucking wish it had. And seriously, if you're starting on YouTube, consider having a fake name. Because honestly, I hate being talked about all over the bloody net with my actual name. It's like school bullying all over again. Because Dorian is Dorian. It's, it's become almost a dirty word to me. And I frequently pretend it isn't my name at all. And that my actual name is one of two other things, depending on how male or female I feel that day. I've never told another living human soul those names. And I doubt I ever will. They're my true names to me. And they're just for me because that's the only way to keep them clean. Keep them intentional, not have them swoop off into egregores made up of other people's bullshit delusions, misassumptions and rude shit. I still remember the night I told my mum, though. That felt awkward as fuck, and I don't even know why, because I've always found it odd that more people don't change their names. So many people hate the stuff they're called, and it's no wonder. Your parents gave you that name before they'd even met you, in many cases, and who agrees with their parents about anything? Nonetheless, it felt awkward as fuck, 
as I psyched myself up to spitting out on the hallway outside my room where I could flee the conversation at will. Mum, I'm legally changing my name. After a slight baffled pause, she asked me what to, and I said Dorian. Isn't that a boy's name? Yeah, but that's sort of the point, more or less, a bit. I just wanted a boy's name. I've always hated this name, and I blarred off into various justifications, technicalities and distractions to deliberately bury the lead that this was really a sort of verbal sex change. I didn't want to get into that conversation. It was too intense. I clearly didn't bury it well enough, though. She told me she'd suspected something of that nature. I guess my more masculine style hadn't gone unnoticed. We did have a few conversations about all that stuff over the next few months. Gender reassignment, whether I was doing it, and ultimately I was probably not. That seemed to sail over most people's heads, actually. When I changed my name, it was a whole big coming out. And it was pretty clear that most people expected me to have a dick and a beard as an automatic follow-up within the next five minutes. So when I continued to swing between boy and girl modes with topless duct tape or frilly dresses, no one quite knew what to make of it. Everyone wants to smash you into their little box, their own little idea of what makes up trans, genderqueer, genderfluid, NB, whatever the latest hashtag you're meant to conform to is... My favourite quote on that front, and I'm so sorry, I don't know the author, is no non-binary person owes you androgyny. That's beautiful. Not every non-binary person looks androgynous or even wants to look androgynous. For many people, how they feel gender-wise and how they look are not interlinked. And shouldn't that be fucking obvious? If we're not in the body we ought to be in, It's pretty sodding likely we cannot make it look how we feel anyway, so why even try? That's certainly how I feel at higher weights. There my body misrepresents how I feel in a million different ways, and no amount of binders or corsets or doodled on facial hair is going to change that. No one owes you androgyny, but nonetheless, I get a lot of questions still about my gender expression. There is undeniably a stereotypical assumption of a good NB versus a bullshit artist, a trend jumper, even if you've been on this trend since before the whiny little internet arse vacuum questioning you, we're still in diapers. And the really sick thing about this NB stereotype is that it is rife with fat phobia and pretty privilege. The ideal of androgyny is stick thin and you must want to fuck them. Even though non-binary gender expression often crosses over with the asexual spectrum, so we may have no desire whatsoever to be fucked by you anyway. Nonetheless, we are expected to serve androgyny, thinness, and a sort of bog-standard attractiveness tweaked into something that makes you feel a little bit kinky in being attracted to it. This, frankly, is non-binary people seen through the cisgender gaze. You must have all the markers of traditional attractiveness. The straight white teeth, clear skin, youthfulness. If you have body hair on a biologically female body, it must delicately complement the overall picture. It must be trimmed and shaped or dyed or perfumed. It can't just run rampant. If you were assigned male at birth, your androgyny must be blandly attractive, pretty-faced, thin, no room for compromise or self-expression, ageing or weight gain or balding or, you know, reality. To all of these things, I say fuck you, fuck you, and fuck off. We are not your performing monkeys. We do not owe you androgyny, be that every day or ever, and we definitely don't owe you fuckability to exist as some sort of new wave manic pixie dream creature, the quirky androgynous they-them who turns your dull straight world upside down, gives you a whirlwind tour of the queer scene, then fades in the rearview mirror as soon as you've jizzed and the fantasy has gone cold. We don't owe you that. But above all, above all, we don't owe you an explanation of our gender identity, of its visual expression, of what remains or doesn't remain between our legs. Take the pronoun if you want it. Personally, I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore about pronouns and what people call me. I state my preference because, you know, pretty much most social media allows you to state your preference these days. It's how I see myself. It's how I've seen myself since about 2011, 2010, something like that. 
Um, so that's, you know, pretty set in stone at this point. But I've also realised that if you're not going to transition, you are, it's fact, 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 you are going to get misgendered pretty much constantly. Um, so you either have to live with that or you have to jump down everyone's throat constantly, constantly, constantly. Um, I, I don't think it's like real realistic to do the latter, honestly, for most people. I think I think you're going to destroy all your relationships if you spend every moment jumping down people's throats trying to correct their thing. I think if, if that's how you feel that intensely, I think you you're forced towards transitioning, however you feel, because if it really grates on you that much and it's making you that miserable, you have to unfortunately change yourself to change how the world sees you. But if you feel that transitioning is not right for you, then you have to realise you're going to be misgendered everywhere you, you go. Uh, so you, as I say, you, you either have to jump down people's throats and destroy all your relationships and all of that. Personally, I, I, don't, I don't like stressful conversations. I don't see the point in jumping down people's throats constantly. It's, I don't want to make every conversation I have about gender. It's, it's weird and boring to do that, I feel like. Or it would be to me anyway. I would find it weird and boring and confrontational. I hate confrontation. So, uh, so I, you know, people misgender me everywhere. I, go, I don't care. I don't care. It's, you know, if it's online too, I don't care. I, I have not corrected anyone about pronouns in <laughs> almost ever, to be honest. You know, maybe maybe a tiny bit at the beginning when it really grated on me. I think when you first discover this, it kind of comes out the box and you, you kind of go... Oh, you know, every time someone says shit, it's, oh, you know, it's like a full body shudder and you, you kind of have to say something. But eventually you you get used to it or you, you make the decision you're going to have to get used to it. Um, and at that point, it's like, whatever. Particularly when it's online, you know, and it's some passing person, you know, if they go, oh, you're beautiful. You go. I have no problem with these words. Like, I, I call boys beautiful all the time. I think beautiful is a completely non-gendered word. Um, you know, obviously, if, if someone is trans, I do try and be more careful with what I say, but I, I find it a genderless word. Um, but even if it's like, oh, you look beautiful today, girl, like, I'm, whatever, it's, you know, so it's a compliment. Um because that is what that person is seeing. You know, they, they can't see what what I am inside and that that's fine. So, you know, um I, I don't I don't give a shit about what, what pronouns people use these days. I have a preference. I have what, what I feel I am, but I realise that you, you can't change the entire world's minds. Even, you know, even if I had transitioned all the way, even if I'd had a phalloplast, even my even if my cock was bigger than yours, there would still be people out there who were like, she, 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 just to piss you off. You know, you, so at that point, you know, why, why bother? So pronouns, I don't, don't really care, don't really care. Um, so take the pronoun, sit down, and sh unless further discourse is visibly welcomed, because it does get seriously tiresome explaining yourself against so many loaded questions as to why you didn't choose to transition. Questioned in the assumptive as though you went against nature by not undergoing multiple surgeries or explaining that, yes, yes, you are still genderqueer, despite the fact you're wearing a dress today. This one is, I suppose, forgivable, as people do flap about in the waters, detransition and change their minds. And if the whole point is fluidity, then why the hell not? But all the same, the question, when fired repeatedly, sneeringly and presumptuously, becomes a tedious... And that sneering tone is vividly obvious even in text. Not trans enough, not queer enough, not androgynous enough, not the sort of androgyny I like to make Pinterest boards about and then wank to. Here's my spicy take. Your mind is more transparent than you'd like to believe, honey. So educate yourself, reread the question, remove the sneer, and remember the golden rule. Apart from anything, they're, they're human, they're just living their life they don't owe you an explanation of the way they felt like dressing today. Whoever you are, you are not the gender police. Isn't that sort of the whole point? Self-determination, self-awareness, self-naming. It's an intensely personal, often solo voyage of understanding. Like, say, the names I consider to be my names, I've never told anyone, even my own mother. Because <laughs> I just, I don't like it when other people dump their 
vibes on what what is supposed to be the the branding of of what what is me you know a name um people people dump their assumptions on you um i don't like it <laughs> Not everyone wants to give out all the personal richness of their self-naming, their self-determination, their self-awareness on the outside for cis people and strangers to sneer at and pick apart. So more power to the invisibly non-binary. I think maybe you understood the assignment better than anyone if to you the whole point is that gender is a bullshit construct, which is not really my vibe completely, but I know it is to a lot of people. Because aren't the rest of us still playing into that construct by deliberately going, ooh, this looks boy and this looks girl, so let's throw it together and make androgyny. We're still playing by rules that some of us don't particularly like, rules that some of us don't even want to exist. But anyway, we've drifted far, far down the rabbit hole now, gone from story onto soapbox, so I guess it's time to summarise. So yes, I do still see myself more or less as a boy. It's more flexible, more fluid, I guess, more rooted in the reality of what my body is these days. I can, at times, quite enjoy seeing a female body in the mirror, but it always feels like a synthetic sleeve to pinch the terminology of altered carbon. It isn't really what I am, but it's pretty and amusing to dress up in sometimes, like the daughter of Miriam Bancroft trying on her mother. <laughs> The biggest problem, honestly, is in expressing myself through a girl's voice, through the assumption that I am a girl. People load you with assumptions, whatever you are, and the shoe doesn't fit. Like, say, I still find it so much easier to write in a male voice. Um, if I have anything that I need to express or say, it's so much easier put it in a story through a male character and let him tell the story or let him go through the experiences because that's more fluid that I can be more honest like that I find it fucking impossible to be fucking honest about you know even though I'm bluntly honest about a lot of things the way I phrase things is not the way it feels inside like there's, there's this huge language barrier I feel like and the minute I Put it through a male character the language barrier is gone i don't understand that i don't I, it's weird but um i honestly think a lot of my mental health issues would be better if i could pass for male be seen as male and thus express myself as such instead of having to live vicariously through male characters in my writing on the upside of being physically female though i do love clothes and makeup and nail polish and jewelry so on the very very shallow side of these things i do love being able to wear that stuff without the likelihood of being beaten up for doing so. Femme guys and trans girls still have a shitload of progress to make in being accepted by society, and it really sucks. They always seem to be the ones taking the hugest brunt of transphobic rants and attacks. So to anyone struggling hugely with body dysmorphia or gender dysphoria, I hope it gets better for you. And maybe this can be one small example of the fact that sometimes these things can fade away largely without surgery or hormones, despite the fact my gender identity has not faded out with it. The fact is, you're going to get old someday. And at that point, you will live in a body that misrepresents you. No old person sees themselves as old on the inside. Don't you think every one of them looks in the mirror and feels dysphoria? or is kept from playing piano or riding horses or every one of their great loves by arthritis, and that gives them raging dysphoria too. I definitely don't seek to minimise trans struggles with this comparison. The trans suicide rate alone speaks to the severity of that feeling. But being in a body that doesn't represent you is an obligatory fact of life for anyone who lives long enough, which is terrifying. <laughs> um... Developing a flexible mindset and being able to say, I don't like it, but I guess things happen this way, is pretty much an essential element of the human life toolkit. But equally, if you do decide to make all the changes, get the surgeries, take the testosterone, I hope it all goes as smoothly and as painlessly as possible for you, because it is really beautiful watching trans guys blossom into their true selves for those that do. But not every journey of self-acceptance has to be so visibly obvious. In fact, I'd argue that most of our internal journeys and overcomings are seen by almost no one, which doesn't make for a flashy hashtag, but is a fact of life. 
Anyway, this rabbit hole really has no logical end. <laughs> Perhaps I should leave you with the ironic note that despite having had zero reassignment surgeries, finding my gender identity still cost me over 30 grand in student loan fees, given it was university that tenuously sparked the learning. And yes, I do still write about my vampires from time to time, and I still really, 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 really hope there'll be a book or two published about them someday. They gave me so much, I at least owe them that. If you're a new writer, or hope to be, I really hope your journey is every bit as magical. Prepare for the unexpected. <laughs> your characters may uncover things about you that you would never imagined, and may grant you abilities you'd never had before. This universe is a crazy, surreal ride. Explore its weirdest corners and try to enjoy your time on this odd little rock. When it comes to transitioning, changing the body you're in, think long and hard, do your research and find what is ultimately right and realistic for you, you and only you. We all have our unique paths to tread here. There are trans people on the verge of suicide because they can't access hormones. Just as there are trans people on the verge of suicide because they were swept along by other people's transition stories and now they're desperate to detransition, mourning the body they once had and... Although it's a tough thing to fit into the dialogue, this latter group is left out far too often. For me personally, with my pre-existing health issues and hatred of hospitals, pain, surgery, the uncertainty of lifelong complications, the optimal path, boringly, boringly, was the one that required the least possible interference with my physical body. It worked out for me. In a very compromisey, imperfect way, and of course I still have pangs of sadness in knowing that I never had the teen experiences I should have had, but I've largely mourned that and moved on. And for anyone who has been listening to The Nostalgia Project, I do wonder if I'd been a boy, well, one particular person, I think you know exactly who I mean, one particular person probably still would have been a part of my story. Um... I think everyone I've seriously dated has been bisexual or pansexual. Um, so, so it's interesting to think that actually, even if I've been, been born a boy, physically, possibly everyone I've ever dated would have stayed the same anyway. That's kind of interesting to me. And that's that's kind of almost comforting to think, well, look, maybe your teen experiences wouldn't have been like super different or not those ones anyway, like the people that shaped your life in such a huge way. Maybe they still would have been the same people. You would have felt so much more yourself around them because there would you you know that it all would have been how it should have been, but they still would have been in your life probably, um, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> Although you never know, do you? We're all still changing and growing and switching up, and some people don't begin physically transitioning till their late forties or fifties. It's never too late, and nothing is ever set in stone when it comes to living human beings. So this, I guess, is where I tell you good luck with your own journeys and to not feel lost in life, even if you're heading up to 30 or 40 or so, with no clue what you were put here to do. The truth finds you in the end, even if it catches the wrong bus and doesn't show up till you truly are despairing of ever finding it at all. It'll be all right somehow, probably. <laughs> the things we stress about most generally are. Thanks for listening, and if you fancy any of the other chapters from this Nostalgia Project, the playlist is linked below, or for the blessedly advert-free versions, check out my $2 Patreon link and binge-watch the lot without interruption. So thanks for making it to the end, if you did, if you're not asleep or dead by now. Have a great night. Over and out. Bye-bye.